Welcome everyone. I'm um, really thank you for coming out to Opera Talk. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and welcome to uh, Falstaff. <laughs> from Falstaff. Uh, it's not even by Verdi. But it was written, it's a, well, it comes from an opera called Mephistopheles, and the music was written by Arrigo Boito, and he plays a very important part in the composition of Falstaff. He was, in fact, Verdi's librettist. Now, Boito, uh, born 1842, dies in 1911, had a split career in that he was half composer, half writer. Probably during his lifetime much more successful as a writer than as a composer. He composed very little. And there was this was a dilemma in his life and really which way to go and he may have even suffered from memory blocks, uh, was it not or composition blocks or mental blocks, there we go, mental blocks, uh, in that he composed Mephistopheles, had it produced in 1868, was an absolute fiasco, revised it, was performed again in 1875, and became a little more successful. And today it's on the fringe of the repertory. It's an opera that I like a lot, mainly because it really follows the text of Goethe's Faust instead of Gounod's, is all Frenchified and uh, not much fun at all. But it's very unusual to have a composer serve as a librettist for another composer. And I can only think of one other example in music history, and that would be Giancarlo Menotti, if you remember him, uh, American composer, who wrote some 26 operas, maybe you recall, very popular. It was played every year on television uh, for a number of years, uh, Amal and the Night Visitors. And he also wrote the libretto for his lover, mm -hmm, uh, Samuel Barber, uh, and his opera, Vanessa. Otherwise, I, I can't come up with anybody else. Now, we do have composers who wrote their own libretti, and probably who first comes to mind would be Wagner. He wrote all of his own libretti. Uh, Berlioz wrote at least the last two by himself, or um, Beatrice et Benedict and uh, Les Troyens. Uh, Arnold Schoenberg, whose music we don't want to listen to, uh, composed three of his own libretti of four operas. Um, and then we have the case of Richard Strauss, which we're going to get to next month with uh, Rosenkavalier, who, for two operas, Salome and Electra, uh, took a play and used the play and tinkered just slightly here and there uh, to convert it to a to an operatic form. But in that case, he, you would consider him his own librettist, even though it was a play by Oscar Wilde for Salome. And then the lecture, 
he was actually in touch with the person who had done the uh, adaptation, a new adaptation of Sophocles' play. That was Hugo von Hofmannsthal, who was a, one of the, the very fine poets of the day. And Strauss wrote to him and said, I'd like to collaborate with you on a lecture. Would you be my librettist? And Hofmannsthal said, you don't need me. Just take the play. You have some questions. Here's my phone number. But you can do this on your own. So even though you see very often uh, in recordings, for example, libretto by Hugo von Hofmannsthal, it's not by von Hofmannsthal. It's his version of the play of Elektra that uh, Strauss would condense uh, into an opera. Otherwise, most composers are going to use uh, librettists, uh, professional ones, uh, competent ones, sometimes they may be too often incompetent ones. And so this is very unusual to have Boito uh, write two libretti for, uh, for Verdi. And <clears throat> there, this is going to be there at the tail end of Verdi's life. Of course, he, Boito also had written a libretto for uh, Otello. And he wrote several other libretti. Uh, Ponchielli's La Gioconda, that's his, that was premiered in 1876. And then some forgotten composers today. Bottasini was also a great double bass player and conductor who conducted the premiere of Aida in Cairo. Uh, a up-and-coming young composer named Catalani, who died sadly too soon, uh, is just at the beginning of Verismo. So there's seven libretti, very little music. I can count about seven works in total. There is the opera Mephistopheles, and there's a second opera, Nerone, and he spent 50 years writing this opera, left it unfinished at his death, had to be completed by one Vincenzo Tomassini, and then finally performed in 1924, premiered by Toscanini. Um, no great shakes this work, nothing like Mephistopheles, and you rarely get to hear it. But his problem was, what did he want to be, a writer or a composer? Obviously, it seems like he was leaning towards writing because he was one of the fine poets and a fine novelist uh, of his time. And then very sadly, uh, on top of having sort of this mental block towards music, uh, he also had one towards writing so that he couldn't even write a letter at the end of his life. But this was a great combination. This is one of the great composer libretto uh, or librettist combinations in music history. Uh, these two works, uh, Verdi and Boito, you have to include Hugo von Hofmannsthal and Richard Strauss, and of course Lorenzo da Ponte and Mozart. Those are probably your, your, your big three. Now, Boito is going to get a chance to meet Verdi when he's very young, when he's 19 years old. As I said, he's born in 1842 in Padua, studies at the Milano Conservatory, and there he meets, meets uh, an aspiring conductor-composer by the name of Franco Faccio. Wonderful name. And they're going to collaborate on two cantatas. Uh, Boito primarily writes the texts, Faccio the music. And with the second one, they win a prize and a grant to be able to study abroad. Uh, this is in 1861, and he's 19. At that time, Verdi was spending um, some time in Paris, and armed with letters of introduction to Verdi, they go to Paris to see him. And Verdi was rather impressed with certainly Boito, who at this point was very well read, very intelligent. And Verdi had just received a commission to write an Inno della Nazione, a hymn of nations. Uh, so for the opening of a great exhibit in London. And it's what we call occasional music, music that's written for a specific occasion. Verdi hated doing this type of music, but of course, you know, it did pay, though he really didn't need the money at this point. Uh, but he felt an obligation because several other composers had been asked to contribute, and so you would have a composer representing each country. Verdi, Italy, Giacomo Meyer, Verdi, Germany, uh, Daniel Francois Esprit Aubert of France, and Sterndal Bennett of England. And he didn't want to let the other ones down by not contributing, so he joins in with the so-called fun. And he asks Boito to write the text, which he'll do. So this is their first collaboration. And when it is premiered in 1862, it's, it's very well received. 
Uh, it was to celebrate peace amongst nations in Europe. Europe is coming out of the Crimean War. Uh, you've had a revolution, major one, that affected lots of Europe uh, in 1848. Uh, <clears throat> you have the unification of Italy, which is just about done. Uh, you still have Venice to be incorporated in 1866. Of course, all this peace will come to a quick end in 1870. Then we have the Franco-Prussian War. But at least we're in peaceful times at the moment. And I thought because this serves as a nice bookend, this is the first collaboration of Boito and Verdi, uh, that we might listen to a little bit of this hymn. And then, of course, we'll deal with Falstaff, which is their last collaboration. So... Here goes the in no, I'm going to start halfway through. You have to let me skate to get to the point. Come on, cooperate. There we go. Um, and we're at 640. Unfortunately, after this hymn, relations are not going to go well between the two of them. So I will start there. Signor che sulla terra cruzate spalti e fior e nembi di fulgori e valso Oh, my God. 
probably notice at least two national anthems. He uses the Marseillaise and God Save the Queen. Also uses the Italian national anthem. You're going to hear most of the, I would say the most often performed of the three is going to be the British one. Just can you imagine, this took place in London. Uh, if Verdi had used more of the Marseillaise than the English, there would have been a riot in the theater. So he had good sense to keep it under control. So back to Boito. Uh, after his uh, little stay in Paris and some other traveling, he returns to Italy and becomes involved with a group of kind of radical artists. Uh, and this would be in painting and literature as well as music, though he was really the sole representative in music. And they were sort of a, a reform movement. Uh, they felt that uh, Italian art was too classical. I uh, needed an injection of realism. Uh, this is a precursor to verismo, or realism, uh, that we've spoken about in the past in connection to Puccini, Mascagni, Pagliacci, uh, this new generation of composers after Verdi. And <clears throat> Franco Faccio, uh, his friend from the conservatory days, uh, has written an opera, and it's going to be performed in Milano in 1863, uh, Boito did not write the libretto, but he was uh, at the performance, along with some of their colleagues. And they went out for dinner afterwards. Obviously, they had a little bit too much to drink, including Boito. And he gave this uh, rousing speech, which was a denunciation of, of Italian music, and was calling for great changes, and then came out with this one rather yucky sentence. Uh, we said, compared Italian music to the blood-splattered walls of a brothel. Now, this speech is going to be published 11 days later. And when you make a comment like that about Italian music, there's no question. It's being directed to one person because there was only one person in Italian music, and that was Verdi. And Verdi reads the speech, is infuriated, as he should be, and there's going to be a froideur, as the French say, uh, between Boito and Verdi until 1879. Verdi will have nothing to do with them. Well, it's in 1879 that Verdi has now already been officially retired from writing opera. Just eight years have passed since the last one, which was Aida in 1871. Uh, Verdi who's a humble man who really didn't think he needed to compose anymore, didn't have anything else to say, uh, didn't think anybody would remember as he referred to them as his notes. And he wrote the Requiem, and that's performed in 1874. It's a great piece, uh, but no more opera. Well, his publisher, getting a little anxious, he thinks that there's still some juice left in Verity. And he wants to find somebody who might be able to poke him into uh, collaborating on another opera. And he thinks of Boito, who was by this time an established librettist, an established poet and writer. And he brings the two of them together, Verdi a bit reluctantly. But the meeting goes very well. And so they decide to collaborate not on a new opera, but on a revision of an opera that had not been initially successful, Simon Boccanegra, this is back in 1857. And so they'll do a new version of it. It's produced in 1881, uh, very, very successful. And then Boito is going to try to pry uh, Verdi into writing an opera based on a Shakespeare plot. And of course, that's going to be Otello. Uh, Boito was a great admirer of Shakespeare, so was Verdi. In fact, in his home in Sant'Agata, which is a, a very small community, and he built a farm. He'd been born on a farm. Uh, this is a man who loved to live in the country, loved to lead a private life, shunned high society, uh, was just content to be on his farm. And in his uh, bedroom st uh, study, Next to his bed, he had a four-foot shelf, and uh, on the top shelf were the complete works of, uh, of Shakespeare in the best Italian translation uh, by Carcano, which had been issued during the 1840s. 
Also on that top shelf, might be surprising, this great composer of operas and literally no symphonic music, uh, one string quartet, that's it. That's not symphonic, it's chamber. Uh, he had the complete string quartets of Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven in score. He also had a French and Italian dictionary. Uh, those are on the lower shelves. Uh, but it shows you what interested him. And he only wrote three operas based on Shakespeare, of course, Falstaff, Otello, and then much earlier in Macbeth. But he had toyed with the idea of some other Shakespeare plays uh, during the course of his career. Uh, he was thinking of a Romeo and Juliet. Uh, he was thinking of uh, a Hamlet. And then for years, uh, he was contemplating King Lear. And even after he stopped uh, composing operas with Falstaff, <coughs> excuse me, uh, he was still thinking about King Lear, but it, it would never happen. So they found a common uh, thread. Uh, they both love Shakespeare, and so the proposal is, let's do Otello. So at the age of 74, he produces, he finishes, has performed Otello, uh, which you can imagine was a huge success. I mean, here is a composer, very late in life, obviously one of the greatest composers of opera ever, but who has not written a thing in 16 years and obviously hasn't lost a thing. Uh, Otello is one of the great operas, and in part because of the libretto of, uh, of Boito, the combination of libretto and music is simply extraordinary. So comes next the next project. Again, Verdi is a bit hesitant. He thinks Otello should be his last. But it's Boito who's going to suggest Falstaff. And I must say that by this point, Despite the fact that there was that long froideur between them, they become very, very close. Uh, there's a huge age difference between the two of them. I think it's 29 years. So that Boito at this point are almost considered like a son to Verdi, Verdi who had no children. And they would remain very close until Verdi's death. And in fact, Boito will be at his bedside when he does pass on. Well, it's in July of... 1889, that uh, Boito suggests Falstaff, and he sends uh, Verdi a little a scenario, what his intentions are, and Verdi immediately starts to compose music. In particular, he starts to experiment with little fugues, and in fact, the opera ends with a fugue. And he's all excited, says, oh, well, get me a libretto as quickly as you can. And he's going to start uh, he's going to complete Act One uh, by March of 1880, uh, 1890, and then by April of 1892, he's completed the first two and a half acts. And by September of that year, the opera is complete. And November, Verdi starts to rehearse uh, with the ensemble. Uh, these are only piano rehearsals, and it's at the beginning of January of 1893. Uh, he's going to settle in Milano. He always stayed at the same hotel, the, the Grand Hotel de, of Milano. And again, excuse me. Uh, he's going to start now with full rehearsals. There are going to be 60 rehearsals. And these are all closed to the public. Ver Verity very much involved. Uh, he believed in coaching the singers, not only in terms of singing, but in terms of body movement and placement on stage, as to say, on the decor and, and costumes. And for Verdi, he's going to get his way. Anything that he wants, he's going to get, because he's ready to pull out. It was the same thing with Otello. I mean, he would threaten that if a certain thing wasn't done his way, he didn't care. He didn't have to compose anymore. He didn't have to put on an opera. And it was the same with Falstaff. Uh, at one point, he was ready just to give a private performance at San Degato. But he does stick to his guns and is going to rehearse in February. I'm sorry, in January. And it will get its premiere on uh, <clears throat> February 9th at La Scala. And as you can imagine, the whole world is full of anticipation, expectation. Uh, he chose as a conductor... Uh, Eduardo Mascheroni. Now, he wanted Franco Faccio, but Faccio sadly had died of uh, insanity due to syphilis. 
And so he chose instead uh, Mascherone, who he was very pleased with. And in fact, he would refer to himself, Boito, and Mascheroni as the three creators of Falstaff and allow Mascheroni to give first performances in other major theaters all over Italy, which he, he will do. Uh, sadly, he's much forgotten today. And as you can expect, the house was sold out. Uh, prestigious audience. Uh, if some of you know the portrait painter Boldini, um, he's in the audience along with young Mascagni, young Puccini, and the opera is very well received uh, on one level, which we'll get to a, a little bit later. Now, this premiere almost didn't come off, and it was because of a singer. Verdi had wanted a French baritone by the name of Victor Morel, who was considered one of the really truly great baritones uh, of the day. Uh, he's born in 1848 in Marseille. Uh, he had initially studied architecture in Aix-en-Provence nearby uh, at the Ecole des Arts et Métiers, but then he discovered that he had an impressive voice, and so he abandons architecture for music, but the arts will always be very close to him, uh, as we'll get to a little bit later. And he's going to study at the Marseille Conservatory, then at the Paris Conservatory, and at the age of 19, makes his debut singing in Guillaume Tell by Rossini in Marseille, and a year later, only age 20, is going to perform as the Count de Luna in Il Trovatore at l'Opera. But as we discussed last week with Pauline, I, he gets boxed out, because there was another great baritone, Jean-Baptiste Faure, and you could only have one great singer at a time at a theater, and this was Faure's uh, territory. It's not Faure, by the way, it is Faure. There's no accent at the end. And so he's going to have to travel and, and perform in, in Venice and Florence, building up a reputation. Uh, makes his debut at La Scala. He's only 22. This is a Brazilian opera by a composer named Gomez, Il Guarani. There's actually a recording of it, and I wouldn't advise getting it. Uh, you'd have to ask for a monetary refund. And 1871 comes to America and creates Amanazro in America. He's the first singer to sing Amanazro in America, in New York City. Eventually, Faure leaves Paris Opera, and then he can move in, and he's there for over a decade, has great success, and Verdi is aware of him, Verdi who made trips to, to Paris, and selects him, in fact, to be his Simon Bocanegra in 1881, and has great success, and Morel, who was uh, rather aggressive and vain and self-centered, uh, received a huge compliment from Verdi after the performance, and Verdi saying, you know, if I stay in good health and I write an Otello, um, you will be my Iago. Well, Big Mouth starts to tell everybody this. He took this as a promise from Verdi and greatly uh, irritated Verdi by this. And in fact, he wanted the opera to be titled Iago instead of Otello. Shows you the size of his ego. Uh, Verdi of course refused, it would be called Otello, and would admit that even though he wasn't pleased with the way Morel was acting, um, there was never in his doubt that he would be the first Iago, which he will be and have a tremendous success. Well, then we come to Falstaff, and he asks him to be Falstaff. Now, he's going to make a list of demands, Morel, and uh, number one, uh, was that he wanted to have his own dressing room built. Then he was going to ask exorbitant fees, not only for performances, but for rehearsals. And this was very unusual. The fee would be for rehearsal and performances, but he wanted a high fee for the performance and a high fee for the rehearsal. And on top of that, he wanted the right to be the fall staff in every major theater as the opera became well known and traveled around the world. This would be for all of Europe and uh, North America. Well, Verdi 
put his foot down and literally told them, you go to hell. Uh, no way are you going to have such control over who sings in my operas. It's for me to determine. And this is at the point where he's thinking of just doing a private performance in St. Agatha. But Morel had written, sent a telegram to uh, Giulio Ricordi, the publisher of Verdi, with his demands, who then sent it on to Verdi, and Verdi sent a telegram back telling him absolutely no, and if he persists, we're not going to have Falstaff, and I will be the first one to light a match to the score. Well, Verdi also asked Ricaldi to have this published, his response, as well as Morel's initial demands. And word gets back to Morel, he's in Aix-les-Bains in France, and would you know, he sends a telegram to Ricaldi saying, ooh, serious misunderstanding. Um, I'm on my way to see Verdi immediately. So he will drop his demands, but unfortunately he had an impossible wife, her name was Anne Morel, who had been behind, had been behind this problem, or these demands, wanted her husband to get all of these specialties. And so what she does is she sends a telegram to Ricaldi saying that she has... Uh, <clears throat> She's put together 40 uh, contracts for him, or like uh, contracts for 40 performances at La Scala, and then many contracts for further performances of Falstaff all over Italy. Of course, that's sent to Verdi, and Verdi says, absolutely not. Again, my match is ready to go. And so he has to give in, Morel, and he'll come to Italy. He will sign an agreement all the terms in favor of Verdi, and the performance can take place. And as I said, will be a uh, huge success. Now, this is not one of Verdi's most popular operas. That doesn't mean it's not one of his greatest operas. It's considered one of the greatest. But Verdi's going in a, a new direction here. He's already started it with Otello. And We've talked about this uh, with Lohengrin. Uh, he's not doing numbered opera anymore. And in this respect, he was criticized to be Wagnerian, which uh, infuriated him. Uh, he thought it had nothing to do with Wagner, or he didn't. Wagner, as I spoke before, was interested in the importance of the orchestra, that the opera would be an opera with symphonic music, or call it a symphonic opera. Verdi never believed in this. Uh, he would always say, opera is opera, symphony is symphony. And despite that, the importance of the orchestra in Otello, and particularly in Falstaff, does approach sort of the idea of a Wagner. Not this question of leitmotif. That Verdi isn't doing. But you're going to have very important orchestral activity the vocal score of, of, of Falstaff, it's not a hummable, hummable that's a word, um, opera. You're not going to go out you know, humming to yourself, ba, 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 ba. there are no real tunes in it. What you do have is one succession of melodic fragment after another. And <clears throat> it's still very impressive because what he and Boito were trying to do was to have perfect uh, integration of words and music. So the music follows the text of Boito. You have an interesting musical phrase, but it ends at the end of the spoken phrase. And so you have constantly new material, but it's very short, it's very brief. And it's only at the very end, uh, which and this is what we'll listen to at the uh, conclusion of the opera, that you have two moments where you, you might call them an aria, and when you read the so-called experts, everyone says something else. Uh, some call one of these numbers an, an aria, which it's not. Some call it a sonetto, which is what Verdi calls it, which is just a song. Uh, and he's very careful to make sure that these uh, two very lyrical pieces are abruptly ended by the interjection of some other character. Uh, they're literally cut off, or by the orchestra. And particularly the sonetto that you'll hear sung by the tenor Fenton, uh, it is 
dramatically stopped because they did not want the focus to be on Fenton, but on the whole plot in general and what is going on and the continuous music. So this is quite, quite different on the part of Verdi and probably has contributed to this opera not being uh, that popular. People were so used to these great tunes by Verdi and numbered opera. Everything in the opera had a number. Aria number one, chorus number two, uh, march number three, etc. So in terms of popularity, it will be rather successful in Italy. Uh, to give you a couple of numbers, from 1900 to 1960, it was the fourth most performed opera by Verdi at La Scala. During the same period at the New York Met, it was the ninth most popular opera of Verdi. But even more surprising, in that same period of 1900 to 1960, it was the 60th most popular opera performed at the Met. That's pretty low. So it comes to the Met in 1893, I believe, and to my source book, 1987, it's only had 107 performances over the course of 17 seasons. This is very low for a typical Verdi repertory opera. And again, the reason being that it is so different. So <clears throat> I guess it's time for me to tell the plot. As you all know, I, I dislike this intensely. And this is such a confusing story. Of course, it's based on The Merry Wives of Windsor by Shakespeare. And where during the reign of Henry the Fourth, which would take us between 1399 and 1413, and we're in Windsor. So in the opening scene of Act One, we have Sir John Falstaff, a knight, uh, rather vain and rather bulbous, if that's the right word. And he's uh, sitting, drinking with his buddies, uh, Bardolph and Pistol. And he's written two letters to two women who are not widows, but happily married to very wealthy men. And these are love letters. He's not really interested in love. He's interested in their money because apparently they're in charge of the purse strings. And he's trying to seduce them by letter. One is Alice Ford, the other is Meg Page. And he asks his two buddies to go deliver the letters. They refuse. So he gets a page from the inn, which is called the Garter Inn, to go over to their houses and deliver the letters. Uh, meanwhile, there's a Dr. Caius who appears, who it seems the night before had been drinking with Pistol and Bardolph, and he became completely drunk and they stole his horse and they pickpocketed him. And he's come to protest to Falstaff and Falstaff kind of brushes him off. He says, yes, I was behind it, but get lost and has him kicked out of the tavern. Um, that's pretty much it for scene one. Scene two, we're in the home of Mrs. Ford and she's received this letter and coming to her house is Mrs. Page uh, with a, I don't know if it's a friend or a colleague, uh, by name of uh, Mistress Quickly, and she's coming along with a young man named uh, Fenton. Mrs. Ford has a daughter, the name of Nanetta, and Nanetta and Fenton will be sort of the very by-the-side romantic angle of the story. So they show the letters to one another, and they see that word by word they're exactly the same, and they're furious, and they want to punish old... Uh, Falstaff. So they're working on a plan and you can have Mrs. Ford writing a letter back and having it sent by way of uh, Miss, uh, Ms. Quickly uh, saying, listen, my husband is out of the house every day between two and three. Well, why don't you come over? We'll have a roll in the hay. Uh, unfortunately, Mrs. Page uh, cannot because her husband is always at home. So quickly goes off to the, quickly goes quickly to the tavern, I guess you could say. And meanwhile, uh, Ford, uh, the husband, uh, Mr. Ford, is going to find out about this and thinks that Falstaff is pursuing his wife. He's not mistaken there. 
but he's also being rather jealous and mistrustful of his wife doesn't realize that she's doing this basically as a practical joke so that's pretty much it for scene two so act two scene two uh, we're back at the tavern and uh, we have the arrival of mistress quickly uh, with the response from alice uh, falstaff is thrilled and we have Ford, who comes disguised as Master Fontana, to find out what this is all about. And he tells Falstaff that he would like to, he, Ford, would like to seduce Mrs. Ford, but she's been brushing him off. And he's wondering that if Falstaff can have success, well, that might open the doors for himself. And Falstaff is so full of himself, he's thrilled at this uh, prospect. So we go to scene two. We're back at Mrs. Ford. Falstaff arrives and Mistress quickly comes running and saying, Mr. Ford is on his way back to the home with a bunch of men and they're about to knock the block off of Falstaff. So they hide him behind a screen. But essential to this scene is his huge laundry basket of dirty linen. Falstaff arrives, is hidden behind the screen. Uh, screen. Uh, Ford then arrives. Of course, he searches in the basket because it's three times as big as Falstaff, so it would fit him. Doesn't find him, and then he runs off looking elsewhere. Meanwhile, the ladies put Falstaff in the basket, and just as Ford returns, they dump him out the window, basket all into the Thames. And Ford sees this, and so he understands there's nothing going on between his wife and Falstaff. This is all part of a big joke. So we come to scene one of Act Three. We're back at the tavern. Uh, Falstaff is commenting on the evil in the world, and he's kind of frigid. He's still in his wet clothes. And Mistress quickly comes in with another message from Alice saying, well, it didn't work out the first time, but why don't we try it again? This time we'll meet at midnight in Windsor Royal Park. You should come disguised as the Black Huntsman. You should have two, uh, and so he's going to wear a cloak and have two stag horns uh, coming out of his head. And all is set, and now everybody is in on the so called joke. Bardolph and Pistol as well, Dr. Caius, everybody's going to be united in this scene. And. <clears throat> In scene two, we are in Windsor Park. Uh, we have the two lovers, Fenton and uh, Nanetta, uh, who would like to have the blessing of Mr. Ford, but Mr. Ford wants Nanetta to marry Dr. Uh, Caius, who's causing complications. So, well, we might as well just listen to this now. Uh, we'll listen to the one may be quasi aria, but certainly the first uh, lyrical moment in the opera. And this is just the love song or the son sonetto sung by Fenton. And um, Dame Quickly has overheard Ford talking to Dr. Caius, telling him to get disguised as a monk and so that he will give his blessing to him and Nanetta during all the frivolity uh, circling uh, Falstaff. Well, Dame quickly tells this to Fenton and tells him to get dressed as a monk and so that he can switch places with Caius and get the blessing for the marriage with his beloved uh, Nanetta. This is just a love song. And I'll play it a little bit after it's, it's over because you'll see how it's interrupted. First you will hear Nanetta sing, and then you will hear Alice come charging in and telling Fenton, you know, snap out of it, boy. Uh, get your costume on.
It just flows. No time for applause. Normally you would be cheering or doing the opposite. Uh, and this is typical for the opera. Though it, it is extraordinary that it takes an hour and a half at least to get to the first truly lyrical moment in this opera. That's followed by Nanetta who is now dressed as the queen of the nymphs. And <clears throat> she's going to sing a sort of an invocation. She's calling to all sirens and nymphs and pixies and fairies to come out and join in the fun. And everybody is disguised as such. And <clears throat> there will be a moment after uh, Falstaff realizes he's been duped by all this. It's a Bardolph who's participating. His mask falls off and Falstaff realizes that he's uh, being made fun of. And then you've got Ford, who's giving the blessing to uh, Dr. Caius, and who he thinks is Nanetta, but it's actually Bardolph in a dress. Uh, this might be the first gay marriage in opera, I don't know. <clears throat> and he, he becomes duped, and it's Falstaff, in fact, who says, well, who's the one getting duped now? And he gives finally his blessing to Nanetta and Fenton, and... Everything ends very happily with that famous fugue. But first we'll listen to uh, uh, this, uh, again, very nice lyrical moment. It's not an aria of Nanetta's. This is the great Mirella Freni singing. That was Alfredo Kraus, by the way, his tenor.
pause keeps right on going and we'll end with the fugue by the way if i didn't mention 
the whole purpose of this is to taunt and to beat up on Falstaff, and that's why all these uh, characters come out in, in disguises. Uh, so here's the final fugue. <laughs> this work particularly remarkable is Verdi wrote this when he was in his late 70s completed it just before his 80th birthday and there is no composer in history that wrote something in opera I think in anything uh, that comes close to this in quality uh, Richard Strauss wrote uh, his last opera when he was uh, 77 Capriccio you're not going to compare Capriccio with Falstaff and if you go way back to the Baroque era, Claudio Monteverdi uh, wrote The Coronation of Popea when he was 76. That's a very fine work, but once again, it is not on the masterpiece level of Falstaff. So this is truly a remarkable achievement. Anyway, that's it for today. Um, we're back in, I guess it's two weeks. Uh, I'm going to do one of my favorite operas, Rosenkavalier. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. And um, 